About 50 days ago, I took some water and plants from a nearby lake and put them in the sealed jar. And that's what we're opening up today. What's it smell like? What's it look like? What life has survived the last 50 days? Those are the questions I'm answering today. And I promise you won't have to wait until the end of this video to get to that part. But first, I think it's important we talk about the story of this jar. See, at first, there wasn't much to see. It was really muddy. The silt took a while to settle, but by the second day, things had started to clear up. And as time went on, I found all sorts of creatures inside. The largest was this ram's horn snail, but there were some smaller snails in there too. This is a back swimmer. Here's a flatworm right there. And another flatworm here. This one's green. And I think that's because of some algae that it has consumed or has some sort of a symbiotic relationship with. The list goes on and on. This jar was clearly filled with life. And by about a week, the water had cleared up considerably. The, the final tally for different creatures inside of this, this jar of water was a whopping 23 species at the minimum. And since then, this jar has been sitting on a shelf under a light that is run on a timer. And this is what it looks like now, with a light providing, well, light to the plants inside. This closed aquatic ecosystem has been self-sufficient. The plants, uh, along with a fair amount of algae growth, have made the water uh, a little less clear and much greener, as you can see. Macro invertebrate life also continues to thrive. These snails spend their day climbing the plants and scaling the glass. These small creatures, known as amphipods, are plentiful inside. It's challenging to get good shots of them because they tend to be pretty fast and not sit still for very long. The same goes for this beetle. There's two of these in here, actually. Most of the shots that I get of them look like this. Again, they don't sit still for very long. So clearly, life continues to thrive inside of this closed ecosystem. But there definitely have been some changes. Some loss of biodiversity has occurred, which is to be expected with any closed ecosystem. But okay, okay. So without further ado, let's open up this jar. Okay, so I'll admit that was sort of unexpected and honestly sort of underwhelming. I was expecting a significant buildup of pressure or, or else a partial vacuum inside, but I got neither. It opened up like any regular jar would, despite the airtight seal. Right along the rim, I found two separate snail shells and the carcass of a small bug. As you can see, they're definitely dead. One of the shells crumbled when I picked it up. I threw them back into the water. The minerals in the shells will probably be important for future generations of snails. Here's a shot of the duckweed that covers most of the surface and... Oh, hey, check this out. That's pretty cool. Do you see that bug right there? For almost two months, this little bug has been surviving above the surface of this water. I'm not positive on the species. It's not a springtail, which I did see in this jar when it was first made. And it doesn't look like a mite either. I suppose this could have been something I gathered in its larval form and is now matured. Not too long ago, I made a similar video about a separate jar that I opened after a full year of being sealed. The smell was, well, it was hard to describe, but not totally unpleasant. Sort of like cooked vegetables. And this one has a similar smell, but is a little bit earthier. And it doesn't smell swampy. There's not that sulfur smell that often accompanies soft bottom swamps or soft bottom lakes. No, it's not really a bad smell at all. It's sort of amazing how well the plants are doing at the surface of this water. And I'm always amazed by how well life can survive in a closed system like this. Here's another example. These are near the bottom of the jar. There are dozens of these tiny creatures bouncing around 
They're called ostracods, and they weren't this common when I made the jar. So something about this environment they like and, and has been conducive to their reproduction. Another important... Hey, hang on a second. Do you guys hear that? Ugh, I, I swear. I can't make it through a single video without... Hey, keep it down. Okay, that's better. Sorry. Uh, these are tube effects worms. They're also commonly called boogie worms because, well, I shouldn't need to explain that one. But, but what's cool about boogie worms or tube effects worms is when they shake their bodies like this, they're not looking for or, or trying to collect food. That's actually their tail, not their head. And that's actually how they breathe. See, their skin is super thin and their blood is rich in hemoglobin. So gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is facilitated by these fast movements. Here's a zoomed in shot of a really big tube effects worm that I found a while back. And you can see the blood vessels sort of corkscrew through its body and you can see the blood course through the blood vessels. These boogie worms tend to thrive in low oxygen environments. So it's not surprising that they've made it this far. But how long will this jar last? Or maybe a better question is, how long will life last in this jar? As long as I don't let it overheat, the answer is well, probably longer than you and I will be alive. In some shape or form. Probably not the snails, certainly not the beetles, but maybe ostracods, algae, plant life. It can probably survive indefinitely. Such as life in a closed ecosphere. So if you want to learn more about this jar, click this video here to hear all about all 23 species that were present upon its making. And I'll see you next time.